Well, welcome to the uh, the Blue Water uh, weekend as it is online this year. Yeah, cockpit conversation, Blue Water yeah. cockpit conversations. Um, I'm Sophie Kemp, and this is Alan McElroy, and we're two of the sailing yacht brokers here at Berth on International. Um, I've been here for five years now, and Alan's. Uh, I've stopped counting. I think it was <laughs> so LinkedIn told me it was 17 years recently, so uh, yeah, that still that makes me yeah, uh, so a reasonably long-standing member. Although that said, I sh should point out about one of the strong features of Burton is the the strength of the team here in our Livington office, uh, right through sailing yacht brokers, motor yacht brokers, and racing yacht brokers. We we've been an established team for some time now. So we're at our headquarters in Lymington. Uh, we've also got an office in France, which is run by Bruno. Uh, he specialises more on the motor yachts. Uh, we've got the USA office in Rhode Island, and they sell all sorts of yachts. Uh, Spanish office, uh, we have Simon and Ben on the brokerage, and Andrew, who's full-time on the refit, and Guardianage, and they've got a great big workshop there. And the most recent addition is the Swedish office uh, run by lovely Magnus and the team out there. Um, and they know everything there is to know about Swedish built boats. And yes, and, and, the, and the respectively all their local markets as well, which is key. Uh, and, the, and the conditions that apply in those markets, both in terms of registration, title and contract. Yeah. Uh, which is one of the strengths of birth and uh, that we have all these the, the, the international offices. So we're going to talk to you about how to buy a boat and the basics of the of the process. So the the first step is obviously the search for the perfect yacht. Yachting magazines are still a a major form of of search for searching for a yacht. A uh, great resource for inspiration, ways to see different yachts. Um, but obviously the adverts can be slightly out of date. Um, so the primary search function is the is the internet. Yeah, I think for, for in recent years now the internet has gone from strength to strength. Uh, it's a you know it's an endless resource of information, uh, both good and bad. I, I should point out though, um, uh, because while it's a, it's a very good port of call, um, it doesn't beat direct contact with a broker that's knowledgeable about that particular boat. But it is very very useful, and I think uh, if the last year has taught us anything that. Uh, uh, while we, well, you know, we were limited in our ability to get out and about, uh, the internet and and also just general communications uh, via WhatsApp, Teams, uh, and FaceTime have have enabled us all to keep going. Actually, so uh, yeah, the internet I think is 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 of growing importance, definitely. And we we sell around two hundred yachts a year here, ranging from thirty six foot to to 100 foot, averages out around the 50 foot mark. Um, we're all massive boat dweebs. Um, we know our brands, keels, hulls, layouts, everything there is to know. We hopefully know a lot of it. Um, we know about the blue water market. We work very closely with the World Cruising Club. Um, Alan or I often go out to the start of the arc in Las Palmas every year, um, get to see past and hopefully future clients out there. Um, and you know, we we help to try and sell you through the the uh, the yacht search and and make it an enjoyable experience. We hone your needs, um, try to think outside the box about something that that you might not have thought of. Yeah, I, th I think it's fair to say that a lot of people come to us with very preconceived ideas. You know, the plan has been arrived at that they're going to go on that blue water cruise, and uh, you know, they're they're. So sometimes their, their ideas in terms of the perfect yacht are based on what they've read or what they've, they've chatted about in the yacht club, etc. Uh, so I think we are quite good at sometimes, as Sophie said, challenging those ideas because uh, there aren't many scenarios that we've come up against, whether it's the plan, the route, uh, or the makeup of the crew or the requirements of the yacht. Uh, we, we pretty much have seen it all before at some point. Uh, so. Uh, we're, we're well placed to advise on, on what might fit and what might make for your ideal blue water yacht. Uh, you know, so we, we often get to ask the question is whether, you know, do you go for a refit or do you buy something that is more of a fait accompli? 
And and really, I think that uh, that that very much depends on on your own level of experience and confidence, and and sometimes budget as well. It it, it drives this. Uh, but uh, I think the the key really is, is is taking good advice and you know looking at each yacht individually and uh, weighing up the pros and cons of that particular boat. There's always going to be compromise. Very much so. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, having carried out your, your endless search on the internet, the yachting press, and uh, pawed through all of the, uh, the countless pages of brokerage market, uh, you find the right boat. Uh, ticks all the boxes, and uh, you know, hopefully uh, this is the one. Uh, so what's next? So you've got to make an offer. Um, the broker will put this to the vendor on your behalf. Um, your offer will have terms attached to it. So it can be an unconditional offer where you're buying the boat as seen um, or it would most commonly be subject to, to survey and or sea trial. Um, you have to make these offers, these terms of the offer very clear when you're putting the offer forward to the broker um, as the terms of the offer may come into consideration for the vendor. Um, it's, it's yeah, that's a fair point. Uh, I think you know while we all understand that your offer will invariably be subject to survey and or sea trial, uh, there might be other variables at play there which you need to make us aware of up front. Uh, whether that's a high sale completion, or you require a slight delay in completion, or there's marine finance involved, because all of these things may have a bearing on the timing for the completion of the sale, which. If you try to introduce retrospectively, uh, might not always play that well with a vendor. Uh, so it's best to uh, lay your cards on the table at the outset. And after some negotiating, unless you've offered the asking price, uh, we'll hopefully end up with a figure that's, that's agreeable for both, both you and the vendor. So price agreed, deal done. Uh, what happens next? Well, in the case of uh, working with Berth and here, uh, an agreement will be drawn up uh, that says subject to the agreed terms. Um, that you would like to buy the boat for the, the, the agreed figure. Um, we exchange on those agreements and at that point you'll put down a 10% deposit. Uh, and this is, this is quite important, especially from the purchaser's point of view, because it then means the boat is under offer to you. Uh, and that any money you then spend in terms of time and effort and travel and, and, and survey, uh, that's protected in effect because the boat, as I say, is under offer to you. Uh, it offers, offers the security as well to the vendor. Well, it's um, a, yeah, it's knowledge a that you're a serious buyer, um, so, so mm. it's good protection for, for both parties. Uh, yeah. and, and as Alan, Alan says, the boat's available to you, reserved to you, for you to carry out your investigations. Um, before you go into contract, uh, the vendor will be asked to make us aware of anything he thinks that, that you should know about, bumps, accidents, things that don't work. Um, you know, we always all try to be as, as open and honest as possible. Um, and the survey might bring up things that, that perhaps he should have known, uh, but, but he didn't. Um, so don't, don't think that he didn't come clean to you. It's mm -hmm. just something that, that the vendor just was not aware of. Yeah, I think everyone will know when they change their rig, when they change their batteries and so on and so forth. And, and, and most sailors have a very good working knowledge of their boats. Uh, but you know what they might not be aware of is a little bit of tab bonding coming away on a bulkhead or something like that uh, because it's been a while since they crept through the bilges. Uh, but you say we have a duty of disclosure so anything that we're aware of uh, about the boat and anything that the vendors are aware of um, you should be made aware of up front as well so that uh, you know you can you can take that into account as well at, at, at the offer stage. So, contracts, a bit of a word about, about the dreaded contract or agreement. Um, there's lots of different ones out there, some good, some bad, some truly appalling ones. Um, of course, we think the Berthon contract is great, drawn up by uh, Hill Dickinson, uh, who are marine lawyers. Um, we were the first to create a contract where you could have a survey and a sea trial, and if you aren't happy, 
at that stage you can put the boat back as you found her and get your deposit back minus any costs you've incurred. Yeah, I think the the key there is, um, and we'll we'll, talk, we'll we'll I'll jump straight in there with the, is the material defect clause in that. Uh, you'll find that some contracts do um, contain a material defect clause, which mm, can be a little bit open-ended. Uh, we use the terminology here, material defect is something that affects the vessel's ability to go to sea safely. Uh, but equally, you could have a defect that might not affect the vessel's ability to go to sea, but certainly has a significant price tag attached to it. Uh, I think the classic example of that would be a teak deck, for example. And while it might not stop the boat going to sea, uh, if you have to replace the average teak deck on a boat, it, it will almost certainly run to tens of thousands. Uh, so, you know, it's, it, it's um, worthwhile, um, you know, examining the, the contract that, uh, that, you're looking at, that you're proposing to sign, really. Uh, being international, we, with our officers in the States and France and so on, uh, as I say, based here in Lymington, we primarily use our contract, our in-house contract drawn up by Hills Dickinson. Uh, but if you find yourself in the States, you'll be using the ABBA contract. Uh, in the Mediterranean, uh, you might be using the MEBA contract, all of which we're familiar with. And we're, we're, I think we're largely bodies of all of these organizations, we're members of all of these organizations as well. Uh, so we're very much up to speed. Yeah, and, and just be aware of, of in-house contracts. Um, they might take the law of the country uh, where the boat is um, or where the broker is. Um, and, you know, chances are you won't know much about, about Swiss or Italian law. Um, maritime law in the UK is UK law, um, so, so stick with that. Um, other, other things to consider are if the contract doesn't mention anything uh, like the title or the VAT of the boat, uh, th they might not be mentioned because you might not get them. So, mm. so make sure that, that, that the documents that will come with the boat are mentioned. Um, yeah, just on that point, actually, if, if when we're drawing up a contract, uh, we, we actually list uh, as, uh, in the schedule of, 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 the, of the agreement uh, what con what title paperwork and VAT paperwork and title chain is coming with the boat and whether that's true original copy or, or, or copy certified copies. And we won't have listed the boat without yeah. having seen copies of, of those documents in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. Survey. Mm. Uh, very important, uh, but lots of reasons. Um, and the key one is, of course, your, your peace of mind. Um, you want to love and trust the boat um, and you want to make sure that, that she's fit for purpose. Yeah, the, the, the survey is, as I say, it's primarily, primarily there. Uh, I think a lot of people think, oh, well, it's, it's, it's a tool for negotiation. That's not really the driver behind the, the survey. The, the, the survey, as Sophie said, is there to, to, to ensure that the, the yacht that you're about to entrust yourself and your family to is, is fit for purpose. Uh, it's there to uncover, you know, s s structural problems and, 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 and defects of a, of a nature that maybe are, are hitherto unknown to, to both us and, and possibly the, the vendor as well. Uh, and depending on the age of the vessel, um, your insurer will very often require a copy of a, of a pre-purchase survey as well as, uh, prior, to, prior to giving you cover. A Full pre-purchase survey, that is, um, th I would say that's generally the, the, the route taken by most purchasers, uh, is, is exactly that. It covers all of the structural detail of the yacht, but right down to every light switch and electronic that's on board as well. Uh, it's also, the, the survey is also, especially if you're going off blue water cruising, it's a good good way of forming your to-do list of, of jobs to do. And, you know, you can't go back to the, to the vendor on on every light bulb that's not working that's that's just just not how mm. not how these things work and you know it, it, it will help you create a work list and mm. see things that you want to upgrade maybe or or change yeah I, th I think the survey not only reassures you that you're buying the right boat and it's structurally signed and so on it does give you a snapshot of that boat in its life at that point and while it may bring up one or two defects that need immediate uh, action as I say, it gives you a snapshot of where the boat is, so it will actually then form um, 
a little work list of things that are not necessarily need doing right away, but things that you need to budget for going down the line. For example, you know, you're buying a boat there that's maybe six or seven years old. Uh, but the survey will probably highlight the fact that, you know, come around 10 years old, you start to, you'll start to be thinking about the rig, uh, or at least the standing rigging, uh, so that you can forward plan for these little eventualities and they don't come up and, uh, come up and surprise you. Yeah, hopefully the start mm. of your uh, loving relationship with your, mm. with your new vessel. Um, so surveyors themselves, uh, we, we don't recommend surveyors um, as that could cause a conflict of interest. Um, we do, however, e each berth on office will have a list of local surveyors which we can give to you for you to contact. Uh, the other great place to look for a surveyor is the um, YBDSA website, um, well, or the YDSA website which is the Yacht Designer and Surveyors Association. Um, we're a member of, of ABIA, which is the Association um, of Brokers. Uh, they have a searchable list of all their members on their website. Uh, they all carry PI insurance, uh, adhere to a code of, of practice, and their work is scrutinised by their peers. Uh, so it's a great place to look for, for a surveyor, and it lists their specialities depending on what sort of yacht you're buying and, and what they, what they specialise in. Yeah, and just finally, then on, on surveyors, as, as we previously said, it's not really it, it's not there primarily as a, as a negotiating tool to beat up the buyer. Uh, the, the 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 survey can quite often burst your bubble a little bit about the boat because it will list the, surve the surveyor is obliged to observe and note everything that he sees. Uh, and as I say that acts as that, that, that that's a good uh, gives you a good snapshot of the boat where it is at the moment. Uh, but it, when when coming back on any issues. Uh, you know, we don't. A, purchase, a vendor doesn't want to see an Excel spreadsheet with 52 points on it detailing every light bulb. I think what you have to do, and if you want to maintain the goodwill and the sale going forward, is focus on those things that are that are uh, really are, are notable uh, and, and, and an issue to the to, to, to the vessel. Um, and you know, we're we're quite happy to give good counsel on that as well. And if we feel something is a material defect, we're quite happy to go back and talk to the the vendor, uh, but equally if we think you're being slightly unrealistic in your uh, ideas on the vessel, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll point that out to you as well. Sea trial, mm -hmm. if you're having one. Um, so it's the chance to check the uh, practical aspects of the boat, engine, sail, instruments, floatability. Mm -hmm. um, we, in our contract, uh, we allow four hours for this to take place. Um, it's your, your first opportunity to experience the yacht underway. Um, does she live up to your expectations? Is she what you thought she would be? Yeah, it's, it's double-edged uh, because it does let you, it is a sea trial, so therefore it lets you check out all of the practical issues. You know, does the engine run? Does the generator run? Does the AC run, if it's fitted? Uh, you know, uh, instruments, sales, and so on. Uh, so it, 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 it's, it's an extension of the survey in that it lets you back up and check all of those practical items that you can't do while, whilst the yacht is ashore. Uh, but uh, as, as, as is important to you is it lets you actually see the boat, uh, you know, at sea. Uh, how does she sail? Is she, is she a little bit too ponderous? Is she a little bit too lively? Um, because on the basis of our contract, you could come back in and say, you know, the boat is absolutely fine, everything is perfect, but she's just not the right boat for us. Uh, and that, that is key um, to uh, you know, having a boat that you're, you're planning on spending extended periods of time on. It's got to work on every level, and the sea trial is a very good way of checking that out. Yeah, we, I mean, we've, we've had um, yachts rejected because they, um, after sea trial, just because the layout just, just didn't work for them. It's yeah. just, just you know, it's finally going out sailing on the boat, and mm -hmm. and they realised that it, that it that it wasn't wasn't quite the right layout for them, um, and they paid to put the boat back ashore as they found her, and and we returned the rest of their deposit back to them. Yeah, well, it, it, it's I think it's one thing looking at a boat s sitting in a cradle. It's a, it's another thing when it's uh, you know it's ten ten degree heel mm -hmm. on it, and you're you're beating up the solent. Uh, and you're seeing how it actually functions at sea. So uh, it, it's uh, yeah, it's it's a sea trial. A good sea trial is quite key. I yeah, think. and and yeah. we as the broker will will most commonly run the sea trial, um, but sometimes the vendor will will come. You know, it's their boat, and and they want to they want to take her out. 
Um, and, and it can often turn into a really nice sale with vendor and purchaser and, and often becomes part of the handover um, mm -hmm. because you want to keep that relationship with the vendor. You know, you, you, if you're anchored in a, in a bay with the, and the vendor's there on their new boat, you know, you want to have a chat or a, or a gin and tonic. It's, it's all about, you know, keeping that relationship and that's what we're here to, here to help facilitate as well. Yeah, so, or email them and ask them what that unmarked switch is in the <laughs> well, station, well. what, what it does. Sorry, uh, I focused a, a on month, the gin bit. <laughs> a month down the line, absolutely. <laughs>
VAT paid in one jurisdiction or another. Uh, obviously up until Brexit we were all part of Europe and a VAT paid in the UK was a VAT paid in Europe. That's no longer the case. Uh, but in terms of an individual yacht, uh, the VAT paid can take many forms. It can be as simple as a VAT paid invoice from the manufacturer and depending on the line of title of that vessel and where it's transacted along uh, through its life, uh, that might still be the qualifying VAT paid status of the boat. For example, a boat that was built uh, and VAT paid in the UK and has traded, uh, changed ownership a couple of times in the UK will still rely on its original VAT paid invoice uh, as proof of VAT paid. Um, in other instances, you might have a boat that was taken straight from the factory, exported and sailed around the world and maybe didn't pay her VAT until she made her return and that landfall might have been somewhere in mainland Europe or it might have been here in the UK, in which case she would have returned her VAT at that point and that might take the form of a C88. Uh, there are other instances in the past where I've sold boats that have been brought back from, uh, well one example would be America, uh, where the owner was based out there, living out there, working out there and that yacht was brought back on the basis of returns goods relief, which is perfectly acceptable, uh, but it might not be as straightforward to explain as a simple VAT paid invoice. Uh, the point being that uh, it's, it's not always entirely straightforward, but, uh, but equally it's, it's not that complex. Uh, you know, it's, um, the, the, I think there, there, there's, any, there, there's quite a number of ways where a, a boat will qualify as being VAT paid. Um, obviously in, in, in the last year that has changed slightly now, so location, with mm. it, whether it's in the UK or Europe, is, is coming much more into play. And, and each, each boat has its own, own scenario and, and it's you know, been in different locations at, at different points in its life, so um, you know, we, we help to work out you know, the best way forward and um, it, the other thing I suppose is, is XVAT boats and people are often nervous about them mm. but it's a uh, you know it and, and it's not helped by our gated off uh, customs well, warehouse here for, for, for X tax mm. boats but it's a um, it's often a safe way of buying a boat because you know exactly uh, where the VAT hasn't been paid. Well, uh, uh, my previous example where a boat may be taken from a manufacturer and it's going to go straight off on a round the world trip. So in some respects, there's no point in paying the VAT at the outset uh, because you're not going to be in, in, in your home country or you're not going to be in the EU or the UK. Uh, and there's no necessity to have a, a VAT paid status on a boat when you're traveling around the world. Uh, that said, ultimately you're going to return at some point, so you have a choice at that point. Uh, you know, do I bring the boat back to the UK, for example? Am I going to hold on to the boat? Am I going to use it in the UK? In which case you might come back in, uh, have a valuation done and pay your VAT to the HMRC at that point. Alternatively, you might say, well, this is a big boat. We've used it for our around the world trip, uh, but I've no intention of keeping it. So in, in, which in, in which case, you could come to someone like ourselves. We have what's called a customs warehousing uh, facility. The vessel can come here, be laid up ashore in our warehousing facility, X tax And that, that's really good in that it keeps the sale of the boat flexible because if someone outside the EU wants to, pay, wants to buy the boat, they don't necessarily want to pay EU VAT or UK VAT. Uh, so they can take the boat away, X tax uh, uh, Alternatively, if someone from the UK wanted to buy the boat, they can simply buy the boat and pay the VAT at that at point of sale on the second-hand value. Uh, and you know, there's no greater proof of being of that paid having other than having paid it yourself uh, on the purchase of the yacht. Uh, so hopefully that covers off some of the issues surrounding VAT. But uh, it's a it's a big old subject, so feel free to you know contact Sophie and myself and, and chat it through. Yeah, at any and point. we'll uh, on the mm. live chat on uh, mm. the Tuesday night. Um, Alan and Sue mm. will be there to answer your questions, and and I'll be mm. there uh, typing any responses. Um, and yeah, you know we we can we can try and mm. try and do our best to help you. Um, so. Back to the uh, the process of buying the boat. You've um, mm. you've popped the champagne. Mm -hmm. um, you're sat on the boat, paperwork in hand. What do mm -hmm. you do next? Um, 
we, we've got a fully functioning yard here, so uh, well, you yeah, can help with any jobs. <laughs> yeah, we, no, normally once the uh, the the, uh, the excitement of, of, of purchase uh, sort of sink, reside, or, uh, <laughs> sinks in, uh, it's usually on to the, uh, right, wh wh where's the survey and where's the work list and uh, how much of this am I going to tackle myself and, uh, and how much of it do I need expert help on. Uh, we're very fortunate in that you know, our, our core business is largely blue water and offshore yachts and we happen to be sitting in a very, very well uh, established boat yard. Um, so we, you know, we have that, um, so, oh, what am I trying to say, sorry, blah, blah, blah. we've got the facilities. That, 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 can, that can be an outtake. Uh, <laughs> we've got the facilities here yes. to, to help. We have the, yes, we have the on-site facilities. Um, we work through a project management team system, so therefore you're assigned a, a project manager who can sit down with you uh, with your survey and go through those, go through the, the list in order of the must-dos, in other words, things that are going to affect the vessel's ability to go to sea safely, uh, whether those are structural problems or skin fittings or drivetrain, all of the stuff that is key to the safe operation of the vessel. Uh, and then onto the nice to-do list as well. But I, I also think the, the, the key point as well to, to say is that, you know, you just bought this boat, you, you don't know her that well yet. And, you know, use the boat, get to know her and understand her. And along with your survey, your, your work list will start to grow. She's a boat, there's mm. no denying that, that it will grow. Um, and you'll you'll work out what you do and don't like, but but at, while things are functioning, you might as well use them and just just explore the boat and and there'll be there will be things you don't like, but you know there'll be things that maybe you thought you didn't like, and and it turns out it was a great idea and and you love it, so just use her and enjoy her. Yeah, I think in the lead up to any blue water cruise, yeah, that's quite right. I would always say to people, repent at your leisure. Uh, you've uh, it is. Most people will buy the boat a season, a season and a half in advance of, of any big trip. Uh, and I think yeah, the first sort of half season should be spent betting into the boat and then, and then uh, working on your wish list of, of what you would like to add, whether that's water makers, generators, communications or alterations to the sale plan and, and so that's on. That's where you'll have to balance your budget to, yeah. to work out those, those key items that, mm -hmm. that you've got to have on the boat. Absolutely. So there you have it. Hopefully that was a, a, a reasonably good little overview into uh, yacht purchase. Um, it, it, but it's, uh, it's something obviously that we're, we're quite passionate about here. Uh, and uh, you know, both Sophie and myself are well placed to, to offer you advice and, and counsel, both in terms of the market, and type, uh, type and style of yacht that might be appropriate for your needs. Um, we're always on the end of the phone and uh, ready for a chat if uh, any questions we can help with. Mm -hmm.